Hi, I'm Jennifer Jill Araya. And I'm Sarah Beth Gower. Welcome to the Crafting Audiobooks podcast, where we discuss the art and craft of audiobooks, and we aim to go deep quick. Welcome, everyone, to another wonderful episode of our special spotlight on nonfiction. Today, we have a very exciting guest, Scott Brick, narrator and coach. Scott, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. And since we are a podcast that likes to dive deep quick, we're going to jump right into the first question. Okay. Um, so the prep for nonfiction titles, and most think that people think of the prep, they know that more often than not... Nonfiction can have more uh, words and names that you have to look up than fiction titles. Not always, but sometimes. Um, other than the word lists, mm. how is nonfiction prep different for you than fiction prep? Well, first of all, I want to, um, I'd like to give a nod because I quote from him so often that people think it's actually my quote, but um, something I got from Sean Pratt was, was, uh, the phrase, people think that nonfiction is non-acting, and I think that nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the prep that I do, and and I, for those of you who don't know, I farm all my prep out uh, in terms of pronunciations. I have a, a guy who works with me, uh, George Weisberg. You can reach out to him yourself if you want, George Weisberg, uh, george.weisberg at gmail.com. Tell him I sent you. He's uh, wonderful. He's got a full staff. Um, very affordable. Um, he handles that tech stuff. What I try to do is find out, I guess, the, the, uh, the origin of the source material. I did a book years ago, uh, Dead Wake, uh, which was about the sinking of the Lusitania. It came out on the hundredth anniversary of the sinking of the Lusitania. A marvelous book by Eric Larson. I've actually and you narrated. It's good. <laughs> it was it was a, a huge challenge because um, I needed to find out. Okay, where are these quotes coming from? Were these survivors? Were they victims? If so, were they you know letters home? Were they um, uh, there were a handful of people who witnessed it from the shoreline? I needed to know all of that because I really believe in, well, as much as we can, shape-shifting the kind of narrator we are. Um, I have an approach that I use in fiction that I've discovered can be applied to nonfiction as well. I always try to see what kind of narrator has the author given us. You know, the third-person narrator. Um, well, simple formula, if it's... Uh, if the narrator, if it's a third person narrator in fiction and they're, and they're just telling us what's happening. Okay. Well, that's a distant narrator. I can be emotionally distant and, and give it the, uh, the perspective that the story needs. But if the narrator is telling us, uh, what's happening and what the main character, the point of view character is thinking, well, then that's a closer narrator. I can be maybe halfway to the action. But if the narrator is telling us, what's happening, what the character is thinking, and what the character is feeling, then I can afford to go deep, 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 right into the action. And I find that that really applies to nonfiction as well. So I found myself knowing when I, when I finally found out who lived, who died, were these quotes, a number of the quotes were taken from letters sent home uh, that arrived in the weeks and months after, uh, after the tragedy. Um, I was able to be a bit more distant that way. I could be more distant if there were no quotes from the victims. Um, I could afford to get a lot closer. There was one part of the book that was absolutely heartbreaking. It was a rare book dealer. And he had a manuscript, I want to say it was from Charles Dickens. And he was transporting that. And um, I won't spoil anything, but I found myself emotionally invested in whether that manuscript survived or not. And I don't know, I just, I found myself going in and out, in and out, getting closer, backing a bit further away. Nonfiction is, is so popular because it gives perspective. And sometimes 
if we distance ourselves from a text, we can add that perspective ourselves. I love that. Wow. Yeah. As you describe that, I am imagining like a a conductor with an orchestra, Mm -hmm. you know, like really finding the appropriate shape for each moment. Um, And in this case, based, you know, on you need that prep background in order to know what the appropriate shape is. And I'm very moved by how that would affect a listener in a way that the listener, most listeners would never think about or notice consciously, but would sink in on an unconscious level. Well, um, that's a great metaphor. Um, I hadn't heard of that one before. Um, I've always, whenever I use a, a metaphor for the, uh, um, an analogy for the narration process, I think of a dance mm-hmm. and our partner is the text. And, you know, some partners are stronger than others. Um, in Eric Larson, he is the best partner to have. Uh, I did his Devil in the White City 20 years ago. And there are two totally different tones to that book, the monster and the midway, you know? Um, and so in that book, I was able to really first start experimenting with uh, changing things up a little bit. And I remember being at APAC, one of the first times I ever went to APAC, and a very well-known narrator, and I won't mention names, but they said um, what they love about nonfiction is that they don't have to prep. They can just read it like they're reading the news. And I was so saddened to hear that because I'll tell you what, um, the people reading the news uh, on TV anyway, rarely write the story uh, unless it's, you know, a human interest piece, that kind of thing. The person reading the news, the story didn't happen to them. They didn't write the story. They are the least invested person in the process, but the author is the most invested. And therefore, we need to do them the service of being invested ourselves. Absolutely. I have to insert here that I listened to your narration of The Devil in the White City within the first six months of beginning my work as an audiobook narrator, Mm. super baby narrator. And that book, number one, shaped for me as a personal decision what nonfiction narration should be. Oh, wow. And two is one of the main reasons that we absolutely knew we had to have you as part of our nonfiction series because your narration of that book does exactly what you were just saying, where it really stays in the text, oh. the, the emotion of the text, even though it's nonfiction. Right. And, you know, some people have that perspective that you just mentioned of that other narrator. Even though it's nonfiction, your narration depicts and embodies the text in a way that is so powerful. It is in terms of my style as a narrator, that book is probably one of the books that's influenced me more than anything else I've ever read. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm honored to Thank hear that. Thank you for that. <laughs> I, oh, I, I appreciate it. I, I have very fond memories of working on that book. Um, I don't know that I've learned more on any other title that I've worked on. Maybe maybe Alexander Hamilton. Um, but I still, every day when I come into my booth here, I see a memento that I have um, uh, one of the best men at my wedding, my friend John, uh, John Massey, his mom sadly has been gone for about a, uh, God, more than a decade now. But the last thing she ever gave me was a little shadow box um, with the cover of the book. And uh, she found a silver spoon from the Columbian expedition of 1893, the one uh, depicted in the book. And so she put it all together for me and gave it to me and it's sitting right over there. Um, so yeah, I have very fond memories of working on that book. That's so cool. Well, I would love to dig a little bit more into that thought of fiction versus nonfiction narration. And a lot of people, especially people outside of the audiobook world, but not always will assume that nonfiction is easier than fiction. (laughs) Right. Well, I can sort of tell what your reaction is to the statement by how you left, but just tell us, what is your reaction to that statement? Uh, Balderdash. 
<laughs> it's one of my favorite words, and I so rarely get to use it. Um, it's a perfect opportunity. <laughs> I tell you what, I did a book. Um, Doug Brunt is the author's name, and he interviewed me a year ago at the Audis when it was in New York, and um, had a uh, podcast that he does for Sirius XM Radio, and he brought us in. He brought me in to do uh, an interview the morning after, and oh bad idea on my part um <laughs> uh but i remember he he said uh um he said that he had a book coming out and was curious if i had any interest in reading it and i get asked that all the time and i didn't you know it's it's typically up to the publisher but he was very kind and he put my name forward and it was about rudolph diesel and um the man who created the engine and then mysteriously disappeared on the eve of World War I. And it was absolutely riveting. And of course, it had a lot of, a lot of German, um, but a number of other languages as well. Uh, a lot of Russian, a lot of, God, um, Italian. And I remember being excited that I would get to learn something new. I did. That's always such a wonderful perk of what we get to do. Um, I never thought it was going to be easy. I thought it was going to be a challenge. I thought it was going to be a four-day challenge. It wound up being an eight-day challenge. It was extremely difficult to keep everything straight because, you know, being consistent with, um, um, you know, the man's name. Well, it's a diesel in German with a Z sound. But in America, it's been America Americanized to, to diesel. So diesel when we're speaking about the man, diesel when we're speaking about the engine. And just doing that, keeping all of that in my head, keeping it straight. Thank God I was working with a, a director. Um, and again, went into it knowing full well it was going to be a challenge. I had no idea. But it was rewarding. It was really really great and again i had to knowing you know that there would be no actual interviews with uh diesel himself i mean the man disappeared he disappeared off of a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean and you know he didn't exactly sit for interviews about this and again i had to find out who lived who died that was interesting because there are two theories that he posits in the book about well three basically did he disappear willingly did he just want to get off the world stage or was he taken off the world stage and the two men who seem to have the most um uh most to gain were john d rockefeller and the kaiser and uh you know in in much the same way as in devil in the white city you know, there came times where you had to mix the monster with the midway. You know, you're in the White City, but every now and again, it starts getting a little creepy when you realize that Holmes is looking for victims. So, you know, you shapeshift a little bit. Here, it was the same thing. There's there's chapters about, you know, this is who Rockefeller was. This is who the Kaiser was. But did they act nefariously? And there were those moments where, again, it's it's not as straightforward as people think. That's where the work comes in, because you have to look. The author is thematically, you know, tying this all together. We I don't need I know the authors really need us to do their work. I don't know that they need our help, but they really need us to not screw things up. So yeah. um, I think the books are always sufficient unto themselves. But if I can help him do what he does for lack of a better word do that you know as he the way he's doing it with the words i can do that aloud that's the transition that i'm always looking for i always when i'm working with my students i always say look for those moments where the stakes change yeah. right and it could be in any kind of thing i mean um fiction non-fiction in fiction it could be you know a teenager telling a girl that that he's loved her for years and asking her out for the first time, you know, that's got to sound like life and death. And, uh, or 
It could be in a romance, you know, calling out the wrong name at the inopportune moment. These are moments where the stakes change, and that happens in nonfiction constantly. So, um, you know, again, when I'm talking about did they do anything nefarious? Well, the stakes just changed, so I have to change along with it. Absolutely. And and talking about the book being whole on, on its own, well, a narrator can take away that wholeness if you just give it a yeah. full read. If you read right through that change of stake, then the listener can't catch it because we've not caught it as a narrator. There are so many times where I've realized things in retrospect and gone back and fixed um, later, sometimes even after the book is done. Um, quite often that happens within a page or two. I'll go, wait, no, hang on. And I'll go back and redo it um, because the worst thing you can do is assume you've found everything. I never want to make that mistake again. I've made that assumption and been horribly, horribly wrong. I'm really struck by, you know, if listeners go back to the first time in this podcast episode where you said, but did they act nefariously? Um, I don't know if you're, you probably are aware, Scott, but like in that moment, you brought like your narration skill to that moment and it like, mm -hmm. it hit my gut and, you know, like the, the, the subtlety and masterfulness of indicating this important, um, how did you describe it? The change, the stakes change. Right. Um, you can hear that just as you were demonstrating it off the cuff for us in the interview. It really struck me. Um, thank you. Um, uh, something I learned from Pat Fraley. Um, he and I have been working together for about 10 years now. And we have something called the emphasis exercise. And he's the one who pointed out to me that there are eight ways that we emphasize human speech. Um, it basically breaks down to raising the volume or lowering the volume, speaking faster, speaking slower. Um, God, what are the others going up in pitch, going down in pitch and, uh, pausing before a sentence or a word or pausing afterward. Mm -hmm. And I remember years ago, I was working with Alex Hyde White, wonderful actor, his father was the British character actor, Wilfred Hyde White, and he got into audiobooks about 10 years ago and has had a wonderful career. And he was in a class that I was teaching. Um, uh, gosh, it was a weekly class, I remember, and we had, we had 12 people total. So I had 11 people sitting behind me, and then Alex was in the booth, and he was working on a piece of nonfiction. He was working on a... Um, uh, a biography of Truman Capote. And I'm going to be paraphrasing here, but um, there was a moment where uh, Capote was speaking to a woman named Big Mama. That was his name for her. I have no idea who she was to him, who she was in his life, but that's the way he always referred to her was Big Mama. And, and it basically the exchange went something along these lines. I love you, Truman, said Big Mama. No, Big Mama, you don't love me. Truman, of course I love you. No, Big Mama, you can't love me. Truman, why would you say that I can't love you? Because I don't deserve to be loved, Big Mama. And I tell you what, I heard 11 people gasp behind me and in stereo with mine. It was such a real moment. And, you know, there's those, those times where you're working with somebody and, and I got nothing. I can't make that better. But it's class. And we were working on emphasis. So I pointed out to him, I said, Alex, I'm, if you don't mind, I want to ask you what you were thinking right before you said that final line, I don't deserve to be loved, Big Mama. Because I noticed that when you did it, you paused you slowed down on the delivery of that line and you got very quiet. And those are three of the eight means of emphasizing human speech. You did three at once. And I'm curious if that was always your intent. Were you thinking that when I get to this line, I have to do this? And he said, no. I said, do you mind sharing with me what you were thinking? 
He said, I was thinking of all those moments in my life where I felt like I didn't deserve to be loved. And I said, well, at that moment when you connected to the text and all those things happened instinctively because they're the skills that you've practiced over the years, that's when instinct takes over and does the right thing. And I've, I've always said, I used that example, that when you connect to the text, all these people out here are connected to you and through you to the author and his work. So um, it's just part of what we do. And, and again, I don't think about it either. I, I remember learning fencing when I was in college and uh, you've always got your footwork. You know, advance, retreat, advance, retreat, balustra, you know, um, and, and you have to be so grounded in it that it becomes instinctive. So you don't think I need to advance here. I need to retreat here. Um, that's kind of how I look at our skills, you know, those eight means of emphasis. That's such a beautiful illustration of that drilling of technique, but the point isn't the technique. The point is that then it lives in your body, so it comes out naturally. Yeah, I, I'm 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 teaching a class at uh, Vio Atlanta coming up, um, and it's about how to not get replaced by AI. And uh, just a a uh, a quick preview: um, AI can be taught to pause. It can be taught to speak slowly. It can be taught to drop its volume, but it will never understand why it's doing those things. Yeah. And therefore, it will always, if it even attempts attempts uh, uh, a moment like what Alex did in the studio that day, it will be a bankrupt experience. Mm, absolutely. Mimicking those eight techniques doesn't yeah. give it the Doesn't mean that you got it right. What is your advice to beginning or maybe, you know, somewhere in the middle? Sorry, what's the word? Beginning, advanced, what's the one in the middle? Career. Intermediate. Yeah. Thank you. Intermediate. Okay. Narrators <laughs> who are at the stage where they haven't drilled the techniques often enough that they just come out naturally. And so they're sitting there juggling like, okay, I've got these techniques, but I'm also trying to just trust my instinct and be in the text. Like, what is your advice to that person at that stage? I'm an advocate of um, uh, constantly learning, constantly. Never stop learning. I took a class with Paul Rubin, 600 books into my career. And I remember showing up that day and, and he looks at me and he goes, what the hell are you doing here? And I said, trying to get better. And uh, I say this, not trying to sell anybody in the audience, you know, my coaching, I, my approach, I, I never want to sell anybody anything if that's not what they're looking for. My approach has always been like Betty Ford. Uh, when she opened the clinic uh, where people could get help with alcoholism, she said, if you don't get help here, get help somewhere. And that's my approach. Work with somebody. There are wonderful um, uh, tutorials you can find online. Um, on YouTube, there are, you know what, there's, you can listen to five minutes of every single audiobook available on Audible. And I always say, try to find a genre that you want to work in and go listen to examples of that. If you can't get the entire book, and first of all, if, you know, if that's an issue, go to your library. Um, you know, they do the Lord's work there. Libraries are marvelous resources. And, Listen to the whole thing if you can. Uh, listen to the sample if you can't. But see what other people are doing. Not and, and not just you know to to imitate their style, but to learn things that you never would have noticed. I listened to a book by Hillary Huber about uh, four or five years ago, the Library of Mount Char, I want to say, and it was eye opening. And I remember thinking, I never would have thought to do that. I mean. She, one character was always just baked. <laughs> she was just always high. And the way that, that Hillary approached that and the way that she let it um, bleed into the narrative was wonderful. And uh, years ago, listening to a Stephen King book and Will Patton, um, 
was doing it and it's broke uh, Mr. Mercedes and it's from two distinct POVs. One is the killer and the other is the cop. And, you know, the killer is really creepy and the cop is no nonsense. And so the killer's chapters, I started noticing that he was saying chapter 14. And then in the next chapter intro, chapter 15. And it was being inflected. It was being influenced by the POV character. Never would have thought to do that. So it's the same thing with nonfiction. We can learn all the time. And, um, and you know, I'm also an advocate of working all the time. Study and work. Uh, you have a unique opportunity to be able to do both uh, in this industry. There are so many titles in the public domain, so many, that if you're, you know, best case scenario, you're going to get paid by Penguin Random House for doing a book this week. Okay, great. I beg your pardon. That's great. But if you're not, you have a week that you could be getting better. Go pick up Lady Chatterley's Lover. Go pick up Jane Austen. Go pick up whatever it is. Go do Frankenstein. Go do Dracula. Whatever it is, work. Work. At least you have the opportunity to make money. You may not make a fortune off of it, but you will get better. Learn by doing. It's that yeah. old, you know, quality versus quantity debate. And, you know, studies have shown that quantity matters. Doing yeah. work and learning through the work. Yeah. I remember working with somebody who um, was really grateful that her first half dozen books were terrible. <laughs> she, she said, the great thing is nobody's going to hear them. And when I want to do Jane Austen later, I'm not going to be judged because of these books. You know, it would have been a lot different if if she began by working on War and Peace, Brothers Karamazov. You know, that's a high bar. So, um, yeah, work, get better. It will. That's why I was also um, uh, because of the effect it can have on your career long term. I always advocate working with a director, even if there's no money in the budget for one. Christina Rooney, uh, she's got a wonderful company, Audiobooks Ahoy, I want to say it is. And uh, by the way, all these quotes and people I'm talking about, I don't, I don't get anything for, you know, <laughs> I'm not financially invested. Um, but uh, Christina is one of the absolute best uh, directors I've ever worked with. And she offers a day. She offers an hour. She'll work with you for the first hour of a book just to make sure that you're on the right track. You know, even if it's money out of pocket, even if it cuts into the profit margin, it's so worth it. The uh, David Nagar used to um, uh, run the audio division at Random House. This is before the merger. This is 20 years ago. And I'll never forget something he said to me. He said, become so good that we can't ignore you anymore. And there's a lot of wisdom in that. And I remember at the time I had been approached by a company that wasn't paying my rate, but they were offering me a lot of work. And I took it with, with very clear that, you know, this is temporary. You know, there will come a time, you know, a year from now, you're going to have to pay my rate if you want to work with me. But I wanted to be able to get my sea legs under me. I wanted to, um, Jeffrey Kafer talks about how we as narrators, uh, if you're a beginning or intermediate narrator, he talks about how essentially you're creating your portfolio in the same way that you do for an investment portfolio. You are creating your portfolio of work and that takes curating, you know, you curate your portfolio. You keep working on it. Years ago, I worked with a girl who uh, a woman who was really, really good. But when she got into the industry, she needed money. She needed to make a rent. And she took um, a job in erotica, not knowing nobody had advised her, maybe you want to do a pseudonym. And I said, well, I only find this out because I was like, okay, great. Well, what's your long-term goal? She says, when, when a publisher wants to redo Jane Austen, I want to be the, the woman they call. Okay, great. I did a, uh, an audible search and the first book under her name was called bend me over. 
And I said, I'm, I hate to tell you, but I, I need to be honest with you. Penguin Random House will, when they want to do Jane Austen, they will not go to the woman who narrated Bend Me Over. It's low hanging fruit. And I get it. You had to do the job. I get it. But the great thing is 10 years go by and she realizes she can change her name now and change it to the pseudonym. Great problem solved. So that's what I mean by curating your, your, uh, your portfolio, pruning it, you know, shaping it, uh, make it work for you. Even if it's work you did 10 years ago, it can still work for you. And I just want to clarify what Scott's talking about for anyone listening. What Scott's talking about is branding. We are a sex positive podcast. Um, we're not shaming anybody's no. title. It was just a branding. Point. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, uh, thank you for pointing that out because as I was trying to explain to her, I'm not judging you for doing the work. I don't know that any of us should ever feel ashamed about making an honest living, you know? Um, 100%. But, and yeah. erotica are the two highest selling genres. Absolutely. In books. <laughs> my wife, you know, works in romance and erotica all the time, but she does it under pseudonym. She has branded herself and, and she, she has the forethought to realize that if you're not branding yourself, somebody else will. Mm. And the publisher was branding yeah. her by just dint of the fact that she had worked on that title. So, you know, we try to finesse these things if we can avoid an issue if possible. I'm curious, jumping back to this concept of you're working and you're always growing. Obviously, mm -hmm. Jennifer and I both feel very strongly about that as well, hence this podcast and sure. constantly exploring the craft. Um, do you have any advice like this? I am constantly wrangling with, I know I'm growing and yet here I am, you know, performing this book that I'm getting paid for that's going to live on. And I constantly have this like internal battle of like, how do I let, how do I ex like accept that this is good enough while also knowing it's going to be, I'm going to be capable of so much more. Like, do you have any advice about that sort of internal um, struggle of like, how do I, how do I show up in the booth today feeling confident, but knowing that it's going to get better and better and better, and it's not the best it could ever be today? That's a great question. Um, because it is a struggle. It is. Um, it could be something as simple as, oh my God, this is the longest book I've ever worked on. And I, I don't know that I can get through it. You know, I did Atlas Shrugged. That was my own personal Everest, and it was 62 hours long. As it turns out, it was 81 because I was 19 hours into it, and the publisher said they didn't like the microphone I was using. Oh. So I had to redo it from page one. So 81 hours I did, finished hours I did on Atlas Shrugged. And what I did, the way I handled it, I bought a hardcover copy of the book and I had a, 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 a post-it note and every day I took it from the page I began on and I moved it to the page where I finished. And, you know, I'm only moving like that much through the book any particular day, but it's like, you know, that phrase, eat the elephant one bite at a time. You know, if I'm, if I'm going hiking, uh, up, you know, Runyon Canyon, uh, uh, near where we live, um, that's hard. So I don't look at the, I don't look at the summit. I look at my feet. I'm okay for this step. This step will get me to that step. I'm okay. I'm okay. And I know that what we want to do, we want this to be art. We just do, you know, a struggle. I know that a lot of the, the, the people I work with have is that you know, how do I work on this really bad romance? How do I work on this really bad science fiction title? It's just so cheesy. How do I feel good about what I'm doing? I always say, remember that the characters in those books don't know that they're in a bad book. They don't know that they're in a you know, cheesy, uh, formulaic science fiction novel. Do them as artfully as you can. Yeah. I think what I try to focus on um, 
I am a huge proponent of knowing when to take the creative hat off and put the business hat on, which is hard. It's very hard. Um, it's an education, but I, you know, I work with Johnny Heller a lot and he and I always, we always start our seminar, uh, with the same words. We are creative people. We are all of us in this room trying to do our jobs as artfully as possible. But we need to run our careers, the business part of our lives, of our careers as artfully as possible. It should be equally as artfully done. And, you know, if I find myself working on a project where it's difficult to see what's coming after it, I start making long-term plans. Um, I worked with a life coach years ago, uh, Jim Kermath. He was my pastor for many years. He gave us the, uh, the blessing at our, at our wedding. He was a big proponent in having immediate plans, short-term plans, and long-term plans. So the long-term can be, you know, where do you see yourself in five or 10 years? And what can you be doing today to get you there? Knowing that you're not going to see that result for five or 10 years. Well, what are your short-term plans? You know, finishing this book today, getting two and a half hours done and sent off to the publisher and the proofer and, you know, arranging for the, but then there's also the immediate plans, which is, Hey, check in with the post house and make sure that we're still on, on schedule for delivering those files to the author on a certain day. There are immediate things that we check off today. And if, if I'm having a problem seeing what's happening in the future, I bring out my goals. I bring them out and I work on what I can do. Sometimes it's just checking those, those items off on today's checklist, my to-do list for today. But I know that that's going to get me to my, my immediate goal is going to get me to my short-term goal. That is going to get me to my long-term goal. Um, I guess it's an organizational way of, you know, eating the elephant one bite at a time. But, um, Look, I, I, I planned ahead for almost 10 years. I tried to get the rights to The Great Gatsby. <laughs> tried to get it. Mm. And uh, the movie was coming out at the time. And, and of course, it uh, um, was still under copyright. And I had my attorney uh, check with the publisher and see uh, some, some books allow for more than one audio book. Um, Ray Bradbury, uh, Ayn Rand there are multiple versions of a number of their works. And I tried to see if that was possible for, um, for Gatsby and it wasn't. And, uh, I even had a director lined up. Pat Fraley said he wanted to work on it with me and that's a dream come true. Well, eight years later, it did eight years later, it was in the public domain, you know, and, uh, we still haven't released it. We, I, I'm, I've got somebody doing the uh, musical score for me right now. Um, with again, the song I really wanted to be on it was two years away from the public domain. So I waited, yeah. you know, mm. and I knew that it would get here. I knew it would get here and you groundwork and you're patient. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is a series of, of books that are slowly going to be in the public domain over a period of 10 years. Uh, the first one, I think, uh, will come out in another two years. And um, on the days when I'm not working, you know, thankfully those are few, but when I have time, I'm recording that so that I can hit the ground running and be ready to go on January 1st on, on the on the year that it uh, that it's in the PD. So always be working. Your image of moving that post-it note in the Atlas Shrugged physical book um, made me think of a book that I read just recently. I read it, did not narrate it, um, which was The Progress Principle. And I I apologize, I can't remember the author's name. We'll give the link in the show notes. Um, but The Progress Principle book is a book written about a huge study of um, companies that the mm -hmm. author did and what she found influenced the quality of the work that was created in these teams that she was studying was their ability to see the progress that they were making every day. Yeah. 
teams that yeah. could see paths forward in their progress in their work were more creative and more innovative and had a better quality of work thanks to yeah. their ability to see that progress. I um this is gonna sound crazy. I, I used to work in the comic book industry before I was a narrator. And I was writing magazine articles about comic book history or whatever. And I was doing uh, a breakdown, a issue by issue breakdown of the Avengers. Um, how many times did they say Avengers assemble in the, you know, the 300 issues that were out? Um, well, I had to go through every single one of them and page by page and keep, uh, uh, you know, doing hash marks on my, on my, uh, on my uh, writing tablet to, you know, how many times did Thor strike his hammer? How many times, you know, whatever. Um, and the one thing that really helped me as I was going, oh my God, this is the worst run on the Avengers ever, was every time I finished one, I put it face down on the pile. And little by little, the pile was moving up. And I'm like, you know what? This isn't my favorite way of making money. It was not the it was not the writing that I was most proud of in my career, but it was honest work, and somebody had to do it. They thought enough to ask me to do it. I took it with gratitude, and I sat on my couch and read comic books for weeks. I mean, you know, it's not a horrible way to live. <laughs> so, but but again, it was it was watching the pile grow that really made a difference. This next question may be redundant because you have shared already about some really impactful titles you've worked on. Uh, I wonder before we you know, get to the wrap-up section of our interview, whether there's another nonfiction audiobook or maybe one that you've already um, spoken about that you've worked on that you're particularly proud of that you would recommend most people listen to and, and why that particular book meant so much to you. Um, hmm. during, um, thank you for asking, um, during COVID when we were all locked inside, I was really proud of having worked on a book called the great influenza, which was about the, the first pandemic, um, from a hundred years ago. And, um, in it, it really explained how humanity in in, on, on a uh, on the macro level, uh, adapts and can ultimately defeat uh, uh, a virus. And there was a uh, there was a podcast, and I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's a podcast with uh, Dana Stevens. I heard her uh, talking about it. Um, I think they were doing it was a wrap up about. Um, uh, when when Hamilton was done, when it came out on uh, on video, well, not video, but on streaming, you know, uh, came out, I guess, on the 4th of July uh, while we were all locked in our houses. Um, that was the first time Suzanne got to see it. And on the podcast, they spoke lovingly about the audiobook, which I'm very proud to have worked on. Um, very proud of it. I, it was it was. Uh, it was a wonderful book. I did my best to live up to it. Uh, but it's the one that Lin-Manuel Miranda used uh, as the basis for, for his musical. Uh, so on this one podcast, on this one episode, Dana Stevens was talking about both of those books, about uh, Hamilton and the Great Influenza. Because even though it was a curious choice to listen to during uh, covid uh, amazingly enough, it gave a lot of people hope about the way that we could get through this. And I was really proud of that as well. Uh, and just funny that, uh, that they were both mentioned <laughs> in the same episode. Actually, I reached out to the, uh, to Dana. Um, she was working on a, a biography of, uh, Buster Keaton, which I got to read. Um, I got to listen to, she recorded it herself and uh, I was so excited because he's just my favorite. I'm a huge fan of silent film. And uh, I told her, I said, I'm not even going to suggest narrating your book. It, you know, you should be narrating it. But if for any reason there's an issue with getting it done, please let me know. I'd love to be your technical advisor. I'd love to hook you up with whomever and get your and and, and get the book out there. So 
anyway, th- those are those are two that come to mind: uh, the Great Influenza and Hamilton. Thank you for sharing that, Scott. Yeah, especially during COVID, hope was something we were all very <sighs> much in need of, and frankly, still today, you know. The and world- bring brings us back to the meaningfulness of that human voice. Um, connecting to the material because how much more hopeful and inspiring is it to have a connected read as you listen to that book, lock it up in your house during COVID versus a, a, like a neutral flat read that doesn't right. bring the humanity through. Um, right. Yeah. Um, there were some really harrowing events that took place. One, one guy, uh, when he realized what he had done by not enforcing um safety protocols, health protocols, uh, that he had doomed a ton of people to die. He shot himself. And, and it was a harrowing section. I was, the director was Tony Huds, and we both just found ourselves like shattered afterward going, oh my God. And I guess I'll, it's like that thing that happened with Alex Hyde White in the studio that can't happen with a computer. Somebody can read the words, you know, a program can read the words. They can be in the right order and pronounced correctly. Doesn't make it right. You know, I always, uh, there was a time where I wasn't happy with a read. It was on a fiction title I had done. It was called the, um, first council by Brad Meltzer. And, um, the first page was a run on sentence. The entire page was one was one sentence, uh, a list of things that the main character was afraid of. I'm afraid of spiders. I'm afraid of evil clowns. I'm afraid of disappointing my family. I'm afraid of the thing that sleeps under my bed at night. I'm afraid of the cultural impact of Barbie dolls. You know, it was uh, over and over. And, and But there's a shift. There's a shift that goes from the straightforward and the emotional, the, uh, the kick you in the feels bit when he says, I'm afraid of dying alone. I'm afraid of disappointing my dad. Switch from that into Barbie dolls and their cultural significance. If you're not paying attention, it all sounds the same. And I, it was the very first time I was ever doing a punch record. This was 20 years ago at a studio in New York. It doesn't exist anymore, sadly, AFB. And, and I was so nervous about the new technology. I, what, what do I do? I have to come in at a certain time. What? Never done that. Um, I hate working that way, but to this day. But anyway, subject for another day. Um, I got her all done. Kept going on the book. And the more, by the, by the time I got to the end of the book, end of day five, I realized I'm a lot more comfortable with this now. And I'm a lot more comfortable shifting between the humor and the pathos. So the director was finishing up. He was wrapping up all of his stuff, getting, putting his stuff in his, in his uh, attache case. And I said, I need to redo the first page. He said, why? I said, because I didn't get it right. He said, I swear to God, he goes, yeah, you did. I was here. I was listening. You got it right. I said, no, I got it correct. That's not right. And years later, um, Brad Meltzer was asked, I was in the audience that day. They asked him, how did you know that you had the right narrator? He said, well, I went through two narrators and before I got to the first council and, you know, I knew that whoever Whoever could get through the first page of this book, if they could make it sound right, then they got me. And I heard what Scott did, and it was right. And and he talked about uh, you know moving in and out, moving from the the nitty to the gritty, to, from the emotional to the to the sublime to the ridiculous. And um, if I hadn't done that that day, I guess this goes back to your question. Of, you know, we were talking earlier about. If you if you don't get it right, go fix it. Because if I hadn't done that, a 20-year relationship with that author wouldn't exist today. So, um, yeah, AI will never be able to do that. And I'm, and I'm thankful. 
I feel like that answer was all over the place. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was a beautiful answer. That's oh. what we're here for, the rich conversation. What came through in that answer is the passion that you have about the craft that is this art form. And that's what this podcast is all about. Well, um, I am even more grateful that you're here then because um, I really want to share that with people. Um, I I asked Dan Musselman and... Um, Sadly, he just retired from Penguin Random House. Well, happily for him, he, he put in his time. Nobody has earned retirement more than Dan. He's one of my dearest friends. He was at our wedding. Um, I wouldn't have a career if it wasn't for him. And I asked him one time why he puts in so much time and effort working with newcomers, whether it's in a, a class environment, which he's done for me many times over the years, or just, you know, the time that he actually spends in the studio with a newcomer, directing them, even though he doesn't have time. And he put it into words. He put what I had been feeling for years into words in a way that I wish I had thought of. He said, well, every audiobook is going to be somebody's gateway into this, into this new medium. Um, we started calling him the, the gateway drug, you know, uh, audio, some audiobook out there is going to be somebody's first experience of listening to a book read aloud to them. This industry has been so good to me, he said. He said, I want to make sure that for that listener, they get the best book that they can. Because I feel like I owe it to them. I owe it to them to make this book as good as humanly possible so they will want more. They will want to listen again. And I think about that all the time. This industry, everything good in my life that I have, you know. <laughs> uh, when I'm in church, I say everything good I, I, I got from God. Um, when I'm amount, around my colleagues, I say everything good I got from audiobooks. Mm -hmm. I call my house the, the house that books built, you know. Um, I have uh, love. I have a career, I have a home, all because of audiobooks. And uh, I want to make sure that when I'm not doing this anymore, I'm leaving it in a, in a better shape than I found it, if that's possible. Thank you, Scott. That's beautiful. I feel like you just answered our very last question for you today, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it anyway and Please. see if it prompts anything new in your in your thought processes. Um, our final question we all answer, but Scott, we'd love for you to go first. And it's just simply, what about audiobooks and this craft is exciting to you right now? I, this is going to sound like a shameless plug, and I'm sorry if it does. <laughs> I, I, I do I do a, a, a business seminar every year, and Jennifer, you're going to be at this year's, and I'm so grateful for that uh, presenting. And I am so proud of that because I see through it how many of our colleagues are becoming entrepreneurs. I call them audiopreneurs. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's very exciting. I, I licensed my very first book that I wanted to publish myself. I bought the audio rights in 2008, 15 years ago. And I remember in 2014, I had to have uh, uh, neck surgery. Basically, I had to have my thyroid removed and um they stretch your laryngeal nerve um uh in order to work on your thyroid to take it out and uh and that's the money maker right and it takes months for that to get back into shape it was almost three months before i could do a full day's work again and uh i took a 25 percent hit in income that year and the only thing that kept me from being just another medical bankruptcy in this country, uh, my SAG after insurance and the money I was making off those books that I licensed, that work I had done six years before. That's what got me through. That covered the 25%. And I see people experimenting now, putting together, you know, production companies, licensing, distributing. Um, doing it all. And that makes me happy. Um, 
the very first business seminar we ever did. Uh, it was right after uh, that horrible legislation had gone through uh, where Congress changed the tax laws so that we couldn't, uh, freelancers couldn't write off their home office anymore. And a narrator, I won't say his name, but he was, he was devastated. He said, I cannot afford to live in Los Angeles if I cannot write off a room in my apartment. I cannot make it. And he was looking into getting to moving up to Canada. And I said, we have one seat open. We were in a 50 seat theater and we had sold 49 seats and uh, 49 tickets. And I said, we have an opening. And he goes, I can't afford it. And I said, I'm not asking you to afford it. Just come. And uh, Robert Signan Paglia, I, I know I just butchered that name, <laughs> but he's a, a voiceover, a voiceover artist and a tax expert. And he, uh, he knew everything about that new legislation. And I said, is it true? First question I asked, is it true that we're not going to be able to write off uh, a room for our booth? You know, if you're a writer, you know, your, your home office. He said, oh, no, you can. You just have to incorporate first. Spend the $600, $800, whatever it is to, uh, please don't quote me on that, but spend the money to incorporate. And from that moment on, you can, you can write off your, your office. And I saw him at lunch, the guy who needed help. And he was crying and he came over and he hugged me and he said, I don't need to move out of my country. I can keep doing what I love. And I remember just feeling proud, you know, I'm so proud that my colleagues are flexing their muscles in a way that they never have before and learning things, learning the answers to questions they never knew to ask. Um, I'm grateful to be in a position where I'm helping them do that. So. Thank you. Absolutely. Sarah, what about you? What's exciting you about the craft of audiobooks today? Well, I have just a just kind of a tiny little reflection on um, something that humans bring to audiobook narration um, that AI can't. I was thinking about um, sort of the visceral connection that we need to have that's very obvious so that we can create a visceral connection for the listener that can be very obvious in passages like, you know, a, a description of a setting in a fiction novel, right? That like we need to viscerally connect so that it really unfolds viscerally for the listener. And I was thinking about how like, well, that that is, you know, can that can often occur in nonfiction as well. Mm -hmm. Then I I also thought it even occurs in nonfiction in hidden places. Like let's say I just need to recite some data. Like there's a table of data that needs to be read that it's exciting to me that what we can do as a narrator is find a visceral connection even to the data. Like, why am I reading this data? What's important about this data? Whom am I reading it to? Um, who am I reading it to? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not the writer. I'm the narrator. <laughs> um, we all need editors. I know. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, and so... Yeah, there's that sort of that that tiny little reflection on a particular craft point is tickling me today. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason that the author put that data in there. And if we are perceptive, you know, just like you were saying at the very beginning of today's conversation, Scott, if we're paying attention, we'll be able to understand the subtext behind why that yeah. is there. There's and, and I want to hear your answer to this, but just to piggyback, if I could, um, I always try to ask, uh, um, I teach uh, text analysis and authors are taught to cut everything that they can. Everything that isn't uh, imperative should go. If it doesn't serve a purpose, why is it there? And there's a phrase that they use, kill your darlings. Oh, but it's my favorite line. Kill it. It doesn't serve the text doesn't serve the overall story. So I always ask myself, why is this here? And how is this serving the listener in this case? So I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Why is this data here? The assumption is it's here for a reason and it's vital. So great. Let me, let me do it that way. And it makes a difference to the listening experience. I think you said earlier, 
Jennifer something about like the comprehension if I'm just like neutrally reading it versus if I'm connected, like it it changes the con- the the ease of comprehension for the listener. It does. Yeah. It does. So what about you? All right. Jennifer. So what's exciting me today comes from a book I narrated last week, which is a memoir. And it was written by a woman who her lived experience is about as far from mine as possible. I grew up in a rural place. She grew up in an urban place. She lost a parent very young. She dealt with some really intense traumas, you know, very different from my own background. And it struck me as I was narrating this woman's story, what a gift it is to be able to inhabit her life and develop empathy for her experiences through the process of narrating her words. And it allows me to introduce a listener to a perspective that maybe is as foreign to them as her experience was to me. Mm. You know, empathy, that ability to understand and to share in the feelings of someone else. Nonfiction allows us to have empathy in a way that I find really powerful. And so just on the heels of working on that memoir, um, actually did the pickups yesterday. So it's like truly done on my part, but, you know, working on that, I just very excited about the role of nonfiction specifically in building empathy in me, in the world, in the listeners, just the world needs more empathy. And I love that nonfiction helps us do that. Empathy is a glorious thing. It's a privilege getting to talk just about nonfiction. I mean, I knew I, I, I sprinkled in some fiction <laughs> references here and there, but, um, but to me, it's because I see such a link between the two. Um, I think that uh, our approach, we should, as narrators, consider our approach to fiction and see ways in which it's different and ask ourselves why. Couldn't that approach work what we do over here in this world? Couldn't it work over here in this one? Absolutely. It's been eye-opening for me. Well, thank you, Scott, so much. This has been a really delightful conversation and lots to think about, and we appreciate your time. Of course. Jennifer, Sarah, I'm really grateful. Thank you for having me. Uh, It is always a privilege to get to talk about what we do. That it is. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Crafting Audiobooks. We've been your hosts, Jennifer Jill Araya and Sarah Beth Gower. Wishing you happy audiobook listening and or crafting. Bye for now.